Namishi, and uh, I'm a brain scientist, and I study how the brain pays attention. And in addition to this, I like to understand, and the work in my laboratory has to do with how we might train the brain to pay better attention. So I wouldn't be a card-carrying attention researcher unless I had my own call to action. And uh, so here it is. Uh, please fight afternoon mind, fight the twinges of post-food coma, and just try for the next three or four minutes to bring your attention on me. Um, so why? why? Why do we have attention? What's the point of having an attention system? And uh, it basically is because the brain has some pretty big problems it's got to handle. One big problem is that there's too much stuff in the world for the brain to be able to efficiently process all of it fully. And the second is that really we're constrained in how we can act in the world. We're tied to having two arms, two eyes, two hands, and we must choose what we're going to do with these resources that we have. Are we going to look at our iPhone and, and uh, use our thumbs to send a message or keep your eyes up here with me and relax the hands in the lap? It's a choice you have to make, but it's a problem that uh, the brain has to face. So what is the brain's strategy for doing this? It has to come up with a solution, and the solution in this case is selection. What if we make the system so that everything about its processing structure is biased in favor of guiding us toward what's important in the moment, what's relevant? And we consider that the signal in this case, and everything that we encounter that doesn't fall into that, the answer to the question is that relevant is, is no, would be distraction. So it, this selection system, can we go to the next slide? Uh, is referred to as executive control. And it really is like an executive of a company. Uh, any good executive knows what to do. You've got the resources out there. And when it's important to get the job done, you deploy your resources. And the executive control system of the brain's job in this case is to ensure that thoughts, feelings, behavior, all of the important things of, of what a, a being human is are in line with our current goals. And the executive system then tells its minions, in this case, attention and working memory, to go for it and make sure the system is, is functioning in that way. So what is attention in this case? Attention is really an, amp an amplifier. It's, it's a system that's used to make sure what's considered relevant is high signal, and everything else that's considered noise is really dulled down. You can think of it as similar to, attention is really similar to what happens when you walk into a noisy restaurant on your cell phone trying to hear. You just click up the volume so that you're able to continue with the signal and. The, the noise relative to that is, is reduced. And it partners with another system, working memory. Working memory's job is now to take that relevant information and actually to be able to maintain it and manipulate it. It's a scratch space of the mind. Now, these two systems, you'd think, have, it, uh, have done a pretty good job of solving the uh, brain's problem of selection. But it ends up that failures of attention happen all the time. And actually, even outside of the laboratory, and more so outside of the laboratory, as the mom of two young kids, I get to see it all the time. Um, most recently, I uh, walked into the room, making a classic parent error of talking, trying to talk to my son when he was watching a movie. And uh, I spoke for about 30 seconds before I looked up and sort of a slightly guilty smirk and said, what did you say, mommy? And uh, I said, wouldn't it be great if your brain had a rewind button? And he said, doesn't it? Sort of, right? And then it was more like, well, fast forward, too. It he turned the remote control that he was holding into an analogy of what the mind is. And it actually made me stop in my tracks for a minute and realize he was absolutely right. We do have a rewind button. In fact, a lot of our life experience is actually not experienced. Our mind is in the past, ruminating thinking back, sometimes savoring, but usually it's, uh, not usually, but in many occasions, it's really just thinking about the past and holding on to it. But our mind also is a fast forward, where we're thinking ahead and planning. Yet, what I want to suggest to you is that the most important thing we probably need to do in order to make sure our attention system's functioning fully, and, and so that we're able to actually experience the life we have, is probably to keep the button right on play is how do we cultivate, the question for me became, how do we cultivate our, our attention so that we are actually praying, paying attention to the present moment? And could there be a way we would train ourselves to be better able to pay attention to the present moment? And it ends up I wasn't the only one that ever thought of 
this is a potentially good thing to do. It ends up there's 2,500 years of, of uh, ancient texts that talk about it. And in fact, there's about 30 years of empirical research on people that have used something called uh, mindfulness, which is really a mental mode. Um, let's see, do I have a slide here on mindfulness? Well, this gets, to you, this gets to the point of why we want mindfulness. Because when we feel stressed and anxious, we're not in the present moment. We're in the past or we're in the future. But mindfulness is really about paying attention in the present moment with a non-judgmental and non-reactive stance. And there are training techniques that can take eight weeks, daily exercises, or a month in silent retreat where you really are having the full-time job of cultivating your present moment experience. What's interesting about some of the work that I've been able to do recently is to take mindfulness as a training tool and offer it to people that are under very high stress situations. People that are, are medical and nursing students who actually have degraded attentional capacity and offer it to them as a way to see if they could actually bring their attention back more steadily to what they're experiencing right now. And another piece of what I've been doing, which, which alludes to what uh, Andrew was saying earlier about the conflict, is we're using these techniques, mindfulness training, with one of my collaborators at uh, Georgetown University, Liz Stanley. She's actually training folks that are about to experience an intense period of stress and strain. These are soldiers that are about to be uh, de deployed. So when you know a large period of intense demand is coming, and where really your attention is going to be a matter of life and death for you or somebody else's, if we could cultivate and train folks to be best able to harness all of their attention and bring it here now, might that serve them in their job, whether it's a physician in training, or a Marine, or a police officer, or even everyday individuals as we may be preparing to, to have a child, as we might be preparing to help our, our parents uh, as they're entering uh, early phases of disease, or preparing, based on the last couple of talks, to deal with chemotherapy. If there were ways we could actually train our attention to show up better using these relatively novel yet ancient techniques like mindfulness, it might be very useful. And most recently, we've been trying to see if the brain changes with that. So stay tuned, and hopefully I'll get to tell you about some of that work next time I see you all. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks,